Good morning. I love that response. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Levin College of Public Affairs and Education. I'm Jill Gordon. I have the pleasure of serving as dean. We are so excited to host Mayor Bibb's Northeast Ohio Science of Reading Literacy Summit. For me, it's a fantastic way to kick off the academic year, and it really honors Levin's commitment of convening community and addressing topics that we face in our city, region, and state. At Levin, I say we are developing the next generation of public impact professionals who, like you, have a passion for change, a want to challenge societal norms, and a desire to invest in the communities we live, work, and play. That's exactly what's happening here today. So we're so excited to host. It's my honor at this time to introduce Dr. Laura Bloomberg, president of Cleveland State University. Thank you, Dr. Gordon, and welcome, everybody. I, too, am so delighted to see all of you here today. And there's so many things I want to say, and then I realize my job is just to welcome you. So I could just stop now. But I've had a little coffee, and i got to say a couple of things. First of all, I apologize for my somewhat casual attire, including, by the way, just got to say, CSU earrings, they're a thing. Um, it's move-in day on campus, so I'll be leaving here and uh, shedding the jacket and helping students move in. So this was the best I could do to sort of mix it up. Um, I want to say a little bit more of that about that in a moment, but first I want to welcome a couple of very special guests. Of course, our mayor of the great city of Cleveland, Mayor Bibb, who you will hear from shortly. I'm also delighted that we're joined by Chancellor Mike Duffy from the Ohio Department of Education, who is here. And um, not just because we are so dependent on his office for so much support, but I have to tell you, he has been a wonderful ally to us at Cleveland State and is a relentless supporter of education in a way that's, that's powerful and impactful for us. And I would like to welcome Steve Dakin from the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. Where is Steve? Right up front. Hello, I'm so glad you're here. It's a pleasure to meet you. So it is a crazy day on campus. Classes start on Monday. Some classes have started already, but largely it's um, starting Monday. Tomorrow we will have all of our incoming students in Playhouse Square for convocation, where the, the provost and I robe up and remind people that this is the beginning of their academic journey. Even before then, we head out into a wild street party. But today is move-in day, and if you are out and about on campus and see young people looking a little bit scared, a little bit excited, but trying oh so hard to be super cool looking, <laughs> those are our incoming students. And some of us will remember what that feels like. And if you see the moms and the dads and the aunties and the uncles and the grandparents, they're the ones who are fighting back tears, looking really proud, but a little sad and a little nostalgic. And uh, if you're a parent who sent a child off to college, you know that feeling. I'm seeing the nods out there. You know that feeling, right? Um, this is one of my favorite days of the year. And those of you who are educators will understand this too. Not going to lie, the last day of school is sometimes my second favorite day of the year. <laughs> So, about that. I'm so glad we're here at Levin. The dean spoke a bit about this, so I won't say more about it, except that I just do, because she's, she's too humble to point it out, want to call your attention to the banner over here, where this institution has been home to Levin programs that have a national reputation. And having come from the, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota, when it came to urban issues, we aspired to be more like Levin. And that's really an awesome thing for this institution. A couple of years, yeah, we can give them a round of applause for that. A couple of years ago, um, some of you may know, we reorganized some colleges. That feels a bit like inside baseball, how we structure ourselves. But we did one very consequential thing that got a lot of people's attention, and that is that we no longer have the Levin College of Urban Affairs. We have the Levin College of Public Affairs and Education that proudly houses our urban policy work, but also proudly houses our School of Education. 
And um, Mr. Mayor, if I may just call out a colleague of yours, Bradford Davey, your chief of staff, right, who is a graduate of here, he was mad as hell. He did not like that idea. He called me up. It was one of our first talks, and I'm like, what did you say your name was again? I know. He, he really thought that that was, that was diminishing the image and reputation of Levin that was known for urban studies. And I said, this person who has a degree from a college of education, my PhD is in educational policy and, le and, and leadership, became the dean of a policy school, my lifelong dream was to see education and public policy come together more because I believe the issues of our urban and regional areas are the issues of our schools. Likewise, the opportunity. The opportunities of one become the opportunities of the other and they are inextricably linked. And I am so proud that the Levin College of Public Affairs and Education now leads the nation in saying, let's bring these disciplines together and do some really great innovative things for our students, which extends to our family and our workforce and our community. So I'm really proud that this Science of Reading gathering today is hosted here at the Live-In College of Public Affairs and Education. And now let me just turn for a moment to talk about why I think this is so fundamentally important. I'm an educator at heart. My entire adult life has been spent in education and not all of it in higher education. I've been an elementary school teacher a middle school teacher, a high school teacher, and a K-12 principal. So I know the world of K-12 education. And I will tell you this, when a young person understands that these squiggles on a page actually emerge to shape letters, and they grok that, they get that, and then they understand the magic that those letters can come together and form words, and then the magic grows when the words come together to form sentences, and those sentences can convey meaning, including the intent of the child themselves. We have unlocked the keys to the kingdom. We've given them the keys to the kingdom to unlock their future and their potential. That is the power of literacy, and that's what you're here to talk about today. I would submit, even as I tell you how important a bachelor's degree is and how everybody should go to college. I don't really say that, but I'm, that's another conversation. I will tell you this. There is nothing more important to our future than the literacy abilities of our children. There is nothing more important. It unlocks their futures for them. The child who cannot read is profoundly limited in their ability to be successful. And it is our responsibility to make sure that that never, ever happens. That's why I'm so passionate about you being here. And that's why I'm so personally passionate about the science of reading. And I know our College of Education, under the leadership of Dr. Joanne Goodell, feels the same way. So that's my passionate story. Now I just will leave you with a little story about my grandkids. I won't make you look at 100 pictures, although I'm dying to do that. Um, a couple of years ago, our, our granddaughter Ada was just two, named Ada Lovelace after the 19th century mathematician, just got to say. Um, uh, and she was hanging out at our, at our kitchen table with her older brother, who was very wise at four and a half and in, and in an early pre-K program. And they had notebooks, because we've given them notebooks since they could hold a pen and say, you could make your own books. So they'd make their books with pictures. And this day, very confident two-year-old Ada was scribbling with her purple marker, and she was just making squiggles. And she was saying, clear as a bell, O-I-C, O-I-C, she said it three times, O-I-C, spells dinosaur. <laughs> that was her line. And her older brother, four-and-a-half-year-old Henry, looked at her with all the wisdom of a four-and-a-half-year-old and said, oh, Ada, you have so much to learn. <laughs> but you'll learn it when you get to school, with all the confidence of a four-year-old who knew that he was going to learn to read. They're both readers now. Um, I wish for all of our children, not only the capacity to read, but the passion to read, the passion for literacy. Thank you all for what you do to help make this happen. And again, welcome. Now, please join me in welcoming the host, really. I mean, we're hosting you in this space, but this is really the mayor's conference. And uh, Mayor Justin Bibb is a colleague and a friend, and I'm so pleased to welcome him to the podium.
Thank you so much. We are just so honored to have uh, Dr. Bloomberg's leadership in our great city. Also want to thank uh, Dr. Jill Gordon for allowing us to be here today for this important convening, as well as for the Cleveland Foundation for their generous support in making today's summit possible. Uh, this meeting was so important to me that I missed Vice President Harris's speech last night in Chicago. <laughs> um, but it has, it has been an exciting few days um, across our country as we really reflect on what kind of nation we want to be in the future. And I couldn't think of a more important issue than uh, supporting education, especially public education, in our great city. And first, I want to just uh, thank Governor DeWine. Uh, he wanted to be here today, but he's recovering from COVID. But he has been a champion for Cleveland, a champion for Ohio's families, and a champion for the importance of uh, the science of reading. Uh, just last week, I was at uh, the mansion with him and his wife, and Fran was giving me a, a huge update on the Imagination Library and all the great work that she's doing across the state. So let's give our governor and the first lady a big round of applause if we can. Let me tell you why this issue is important to me. Um, well, my mom graduated from John Adams High School. Uh, she could barely read or write. She graduated in 1978. And I remember in my early days at, at elementary school, uh, she made it very clear that she wanted her baby to read at grade level every single year in elementary school. Uh, one of my classmates from elementary school is here, uh, Sherry Buford's in the room. And first grade, second grade, third grade, every teacher required us to read at least 10 books a week to get a free pizza pan <laughs> pizza from Pizza Hut. <laughs> and um, I went to my local library, the 131st Street branch, every week to get my 10 books. <laughs> but it was that early rigor, that early discipline, that early accountability that my teachers, in partnership with my mother, in partnership with the library, that made it possible for me to read at grade level every step of the way. But unfortunately, that's not the case right now for many of our young scholars uh, across the district. That's why I'm really excited about uh, the work that Dr. Morgan is doing to make sure that we have a rigorous, a rigorous curriculum across all of our schools in CMSD. Because you know we've had pockets of excellence for a long time. But the moment now requires us to have a system of excellence all across the district. So Dr. Morgan, thank you for your leadership, and thank you for being here today. Let's give him a big round of applause if we can. And I'm, al I'm also excited to see that the state um, ha has really worked together uh, to pass House Bill 33. Uh, I believe reading and the science of reading it's not a partisan issue, right? I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, everybody should be focused on how our young children are succeeding inside of our schools. And this piece of legislation is gonna give us the right accountability and the right resources to support our teachers, support our principals, and support a continuous network of education across the state of Ohio and across the district. So we are here today for three reasons. One, to learn about the science of reading and how classroom learning will change so all of our children will learn how to read at grade level. Secondly, we are here to strengthen and create a network of resources that can bring to individuals and families all together to help them succeed. And lastly, we are here to join forces with our friends and colleagues to support classroom teaching when students are not in school because it certainly requires a community approach and all of government approach to address this issue. So thanks for being here today on an early Friday morning. <laughs> we have some great panels ahead and know that my office alongside Chief Michelle Pomerantz will stand with you and support you as we do the Lord's work, making sure our babies can read at great, le great level. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.
And now I have the distinct pleasure to bring to the stage the director of the Department of Education and Workforce for the state of Ohio, Stephen Dakin. Stephen. Good morning. Oh, that was rousing. I love it. As a former teacher, you can do better, right? Good morning. Good morning. Ah, that's for my heart. For my heart. Thank you, Mayor Bibb. I uh, really appreciate um, your leadership uh, in, in this initiative. And um, I can't tell you how important it is to have the chief executive of a major city uh, devoting your time, your staff, to and, and committed to all things about making sure, to use your word, babies can read. And, and so thank you very much. Um, I also like to thank Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, you stole half my speech, by the way. Um, and uh, Dr. Gordon as well, and the esteemed panel members and speakers today. A um, couple shout outs. I also will acknowledge Chancellor Duffy. Uh, he and I came into our roles about the same time, and uh, we are joined at the hip in all things science of reading. And he's a great colleague and, and, and just an inspiration for me personally um, in, in his work uh, with uh, higher education. Um, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Morgan. Uh, he and I have had the chance to uh, talk a few times. We were at the governor's residence a few months ago and, and uh, excited about his vision and what he's bringing to uh, children and staff in the Cleveland uh, Municipal uh, Metropolitan School District. And, uh, uh, and so looking forward to continued dialogue. Um, obviously, Governor DeWine is deeply uh, disappointed that he cannot be here today. and I. I am no substitute for the governor in that respect, um, but I will tell you that I'm standing here because of this governor. Um, when, when the governor took action um, early uh, around the science of reading with an executive order that science of reading shall be the uh, reading, uh, the components of science of reading will be the lay of the land in Ohio, I said, sign me up. I mean, it, this, is a, this is a gentleman who has spent his entire career, if you go back and look at his career, he's always advocated for children. If you heard his State of the State speech this year, it was a, there was kind of a running bet with some people out there that uh, how many times would the governor use the word intel in his, uh, in his State of the State speech, and he used it exactly zero times because the entire speech was about children. It was about finding eyeglasses for kids who need them. It's about you know communities collaborating around the medical needs of students and families by creating uh, uh, school-based health clinics, um, and and it's about making sure every kid's on a pathway to something as they matriculate to to uh, the K-12 education system, and so he has been consistent in his advocacy for young people through his entire career, um, and the literacy achievement continues to be the focus of the DeWine Houston administration, um, and, and especially with respect to how we teach reading to young people with the science of reading. I'm really excited here. I, there's a young person in the audience I'm going to call out. She doesn't know this, but Allie Clark is sitting there right now. Uh, Allie was a student in my high school when I was principal of Reynoldsburg High School in Columbus, Ohio. And she's reached out to me a couple times over the course of the last couple of years, and I'm so proud of how she's, uh, where she's landed and what she's doing. And, and that, that, in the end, for us, those of us, and to uh, President Bloomberg's remarks, this is why you get into education. I got in it to make a difference. And, and you know, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I, it's probably a shock as you're looking at me right now. Um, but I signed up. I didn't have to have a job. I, have to, I was blessed to be in a position that I didn't have to work, um, but I did this because of the opportunity before us to make a difference. I fundamentally believe in my heart of hearts that we as adults have a moral imperative to shepherd our young people to success. And, and, and uh, oh, you can clap for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and, and I think in doing that, um, it, you know, one of the things that we've that you've figured out here in Northeast Ohio is how a community can come together to do just that, because we have a lot of assets in our in our state, a lot of assets in our communities, 
And sometimes we're not as good at reaching out and leveraging those assets on behalf of young people. And this is the moment that we can do that. I, I've said all along, I want to lead the nation literacy. Imagine the economic prosperity for kids and families if every young person who matriculates through the K-12 system is reading at or above grade level. Think about the doors that get open for young people when that happens. It's the most fundamental thing we can do as an educational system, as, as a set of community members, is to make sure children can, lead, uh, can read. And so, so that's the call to action. So when the governor and I were here in April, um, we were ecstatic to engage in a conversation about the science of reading uh, with uh, members of the panel at the time. And we are equally ecstatic of what you have taken I, there's we kind of use a metaphor because the Olympics is just fresh in my mind because I love watching all things Olympics. Um, but it's kind of like the governor lit the torch and, and now just like the Olympic flame, many of you are picking it up and running with it. And that's, that was his vision all along. Set, plant the seed, set the stage, lead by example, and then let others run with it. And so we are absolutely grateful uh, for that. Um, and and let, me, let me just say this. I, I'm, I grew up in Northwest Ohio. I had the great fortune of having two loving parents. Um, but they made sure that I understood that life is a gift. And that we have an obligation to help others who are not as fortunate as us. And, and, and so I've taken that to heart. And so my team and I, got to, I, do, I need to do a shout out also to one of my team members who's sitting in the front uh, uh, row there. Melissa Weber Mayer is our chief of literacy. Melissa came to the department eight years ago now, and she came with it with the science of reading. So we've been at this for a while in the Department of Education and Workforce. This is not new things. As a superintendent in Reynoldsburg City, we did what was called structured literacy at the time, which is the science of reading. And so this is not new science. Some people say, wow, this is new. No, it's not. It's been around. And, and, and now the data, the research, the science behind it is unequivocal. And that's why it was called action around the science of reading. But I appreciate Melissa's leadership uh, in developing a framework in Ohio for all things literacy. Um, but going back to my parents, um, they taught me to be grateful. And so. My folks at the Department of Education understand I open up every meeting with my executive staff saying, uh, asking for gratitude. What are people grateful for on that particular day? Not everybody has to say anything, you know, blah, 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 but I just want to make sure we never lose that opportunity. And I forgot to set my watch again. I do that all the time. I am so sorry. Um, so I am grateful for you. I am grateful for you taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and be part of this summit as a kickoff to things to come. And that's the exciting part. So thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Um, we know uh, that the science of reading, that we face a, a nervous challenge right now, uh, just shy of 40% of our third graders are not reading at grade level in this state. Uh, we have about 300,000 students in, in K through three who are not reading at grade level. And I don't see how anybody can not see that as a crisis. And, and so this is why you're here. You know that. And, and we're together. We're going to lock arms in and, 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 and a partnership first approach. Lock arms and we're going to accomplish the goals of making sure that all kids, and I always say all means all in capital letters, not some, uh, kids are able to be literate as they move through the system. We know it's the key to all other learning. Um, and I really am, I am deeply appreciative to the governor and the General Assembly for making historic investments in the science of reading. Um, so we're rolling out uh, high quality professional development. We, we created a vendor list of high quality instructional core and intervention materials. And we've got literacy coaches assigned to those districts who are in most, most need. And, and that just doesn't happen often. It's, it's truly a bipartisan effort in our legislature to, to get this in, into law. So, um, and as I, said before, we know more about how the brain works today than we ever have before. That's why the science of reading is important. 
In five years from now, I suspect we'll know even more. In 10 years from now. So our, our, our responsibility is to continue to invest in the research and the science behind these things and ensure that we are implementing the science of reading with fidelity. That is really our focus at the Department of Education and Workforce now, is to work with our districts uh, uh, arm in arm to properly implement the science of reading. And that is so, so crucial. All the research points to it as to why that's, that's really important. Um, so I want to point out one thing, because the, the, the role of parents and others in our community is absolutely crucial. Um, we've got a, a number of assets I mentioned, communities like libraries and other things that can really join arms and figure this out with us. Um, but practicing kind of effective, consistent, positive reading habits at home is very important. So we need to work with our parents uh, in helping them with, give them the tools and support they need to help that. One of the, uh, and we know the earlier that a child reads, the better off they're gonna be. Fewer discipline issues, uh, uh, improved academic achievement uh, across all levels and in workforce and also in life. We do have a program now, um, it was mentioned earlier, about that focus on reading right away at home before they even get in school. And, uh, and I think you know this, but since 2019, First Lady DeWine has dedicated much of her time and energy to promote uh, and expand participation in the, in the Dolly Parton Imagination Library of Ohio. When she first became involved in the Imagination Library, 13% of Ohio kids uh, ages birth to five were receiving free age-appropriate books through this program, 13%. Today, 61% of kids in Ohio are currently enrolled. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> That's 409,075 kids across our state receiving books. In Cuyahoga County, where the Literacy Cooperative is a local partner, 59% of those eligible are receiving books every single month. So, thank you. I got a real quick story about Imagination Library. So, I, have, I am now the proud uh, grandfather of, of two children. Uh, I have a, a granddaughter who's two and a half going on 10. Uh, and a, a grandson who's uh, going to turn one here in another month. So uh, my daughter Erica, uh, who's an attorney by training, signed up for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library and started getting books delivered to uh, their home. So Caroline, my granddaughter and I, we, we read. And, and so one of the favorite books we had was Ice Cream Face. And so we would read Ice Cream Face. And, and, uh, and so what happened with Ice Cream Face as things moved forward is that I started then after we got done reading Ice Cream Face to go get ice cream. <laughs> and my daughter, who's kind of a health nut, said, why don't you do vegetables? <laughs> and I'm like, Papa doesn't do vegetables. <laughs> Papa does ice cream and then Papa walks out and goes back home. So, so I'm always in trouble with my daughter, but you know what? That's okay. That's absolutely okay. Um, and and uh, so um, the other shout out I need to do is all things with the Stay in the Game um, Attendance Network. Um, thanks to the generosity of the Cleveland Browns Foundation, Harvard's uh, Proving Ground, uh, and the Department of Education, we've joined together to create this network. Now Battelle Memorial Institute is actually managing the network. Um, I think I saw Renee here earlier. Renee, thank you. Um, for the Cleveland Balance Foundation. Um, and I can't tell you how important that is to address the issue of chronic absenteeism. Uh, it, it is a challenge in our state right now that I know we can deal with. Uh, I think things like the science of reading should help us along that way. Um, and then as we think about workforce, which is the new title in the department, we'll think about how we can make high school more engaging for our young people. And thank you for your leadership with respect to getting kids into opportunities while they're still in high school to kind of figure it out, and, and we need more of that. So I want to uh, end by just saying that we know that, um, that literacy is something that connects us all. Uh, you wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. Um, and we know how important you are to this effort. Uh, it really can't happen without you. What you're doing today is a big, big deal. And, and we like to see more of this around our state um, having conversations. Uh, Mayor, again, your leadership is just so, so important for that happening. Um, 
So thank you for joining us with the Vision for Science of Reading. I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers and panelists today, and please enjoy the summit. Thanks again. Good morning, and thank you, Director Dakin. I'm looking forward to going to get ice cream afterwards, Pop Pop. <laughs> Uh, so nice to see all of you here today. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Michelle Pomerantz, and I am the Chief of Education for Mayor Justin Bibb, City of Cleveland. And once again, one round of applause for uh, Director Dakin. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for taking time to join us this morning for our launch of Side by Side, a community network of educators, professionals, and others committed to implementing the science of reading with strategic intentions and fidelity. Director Deccan, please let Governor know we appreciate his thoughtful leadership and commitment to improving literacy, and we look forward to working with you and the administration as the new school year unfolds. And thank you, President Laura Bloomberg, President Dr. Laura Bloomberg, and Dr. Jill Gordon for hosting Mayor Bibb's Northeast Ohio Science of Reading Literacy Summit today. Along with Mayor Bibb, I want to welcome you to this important convening and for most of us gathered here today, I've had the pleasure of either teaching with you, knowing you, mentoring a few of you, and it's just so exciting to see this room full of people ready to take the charge and take that baton to continue the work around literacy. So for most of you, we have spent our adult lives teaching and guiding young people. Every now and then, opportunities rise for a diverse group of leaders to come together to capitalize on a common agenda and the science of reading is one such opportunity. Our agenda today includes two expert panels, audience Q&A, informative videos, and an opportunity to suggest resources, next steps, and who else should know about this. We also have a box lunch at the end of the program as a thank you, so stick with us. And don't forget to visit the Scrabble Sight Word selfie station at near the Euclid entrance to the atrium. Earlier this year, Governor DeWine signed into law House Bill 33. This legislation enables an evidence-based approach to teaching our young people how to read so that they can create for themselves a strong foundation for lifelong learning. At its heart, the legislation includes a proven method for teaching reading in the classroom. It also gives community members and organizations a clear framework for how families and our community can reinforce classroom growth and literacy. I am a former first grade teacher. I taught first grade for 22 years in the city of Cleveland. And I taught reading using the science of reading, but we didn't call it that at the time, teaching Cleveland. As Director Dakin said, this is not new. This is not new math or new algebra or the census, or no, learning the metric system back when I was in fourth grade. Nothing new here. This is the tried and true science of reading protocols that teachers and educators have taught for many, many years. But at every step of my professional experience, even coming from the classroom, I've maintained a key eye on how all of us interested in investing in transforming education can work together. Specifically, to work together to make sure our youngest learners benefit from rigorous instruction in the classroom, as well as reinforcing experiences at home and in our neighborhoods. Since the governor signed HB 33, and I got to meet Di Director Dakin at, back in April at the Cleveland Public Library and we, we lit the fire, um, I have said it over and over again that this is a unique moment for all. It's a moment where we can reflect on lessons learned from past efforts to significantly raise literacy outcomes and align new community strategies to do the same. You will hear this message many times this morning and after today. The intent of this summit is not to create a new organization or hierarchical structure to define and manage this work. The intent of this effort is to identify and connect all of us, leaders of networks in our community at large, to do so with a hyper-focused effort to link our young learners, their families, with help to improve the literacy levels in a meaningful way. Before we move to our first panel, I'd like to share just a few literacy facts that point to why we are here today. First. For years, the percentage of the nation's fourth graders in public schools who can read proficiently has hovered around 35%. Children who are not reading proficiently by fourth grade 
are four times less likely to graduate from high school on time. Second, for students experiencing poverty, the situation is even more dire. 82% of students eligible for free or reduced lunches are not reading at or above proficient levels by fourth grade. Third, the Literacy Project Foundation found that three out of five people incarcerated in prisons cannot read and that 85% of minors who have been charged with a crime have trouble reading. Such literacy disparities are linked with high re recidivism uh, rates. Every state in the nation has large percentages of students who are unable to read at grade level. And in fact, nationally, more than 8.7 million low-income students in kindergartens through fifth grade are not proficient in reading. That is the equivalent of the entire population of Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, and Atlanta. If students do not receive effective interventions early and by second grade, the less likely they are to ever become grade level readers. With proper evidence-based interventions in the early grades, children can and will become strong, proficient readers. And the science of reading can lead us this way. Our first group of panelists are here to challenge the status quo, offer a glimpse of what success looks like when you change your literacy or instructional approach. The first of our side-by-side -side panelists are going to present a brief overview of what House Bill 33 means for practitioners and its implications for teacher training. We will also hear a success story from my colleague and good friend, Warrensville Heights School District and uh, Superintendent Dr. Jolly, and how his school district became an earlier adopter and a success story for the science of reading curriculum. Now I would like to introduce our panelists for panel number one. Dr. Jennifer Dott, a partner in planning for this, the Assistant Superintendent of the Educational Service Centers of Northeast Ohio. Come on up. Kelly Struckus, the Director of Teaching and Learning at the Education Services Center of Northeast Ohio. And Dr. Donald Jolly, who is the Superintendent of the Warrensville Heights City School District. Please proceed. And <laughs> once you're up, we'll start the video. Oh, okay. We do the video first or uh, at the end? I forgot. Video planning first. Okay, video first. <laughs> Thank you. Good. I see a lot of growth when I look out at them. the science of reading, has, it's proven that it works and that it produces better readers. G -g. G -g. It's literally like a road map to reading, um, as well as like to their brain. The word is, brain. there we go, kiss your brains. We want to be the best elementary school in the state of Ohio. I believe that if you teach kids how to read fundamentally, then you teach them to be critical thinkers. And if you teach them to be critical thinkers, you empower them to go into the world. As snakes. As snakes. We like um, to sound it, and then we, then we keep trying it until we get the word. I clap them out. It makes it easier for me to understand. Easier because there is actual brain science involved in the science of reading methods. Different parts of the brain um, work in unison systematically when you see a word or hear a word. When someone is learning to read, pathways in the brain must be built. Science shows that when readers read, the brain activates letter recognition with the sounds that letters make to the meaning of the word. Explicit instruction helps to build these pathways. Through instructional strategies that are based on the science of reading, we're able to help kids make those connections. Dr. Dottie Erb, a prior skeptic, now embraces science of reading methods, which have been infused into teaching future teachers at Marietta College. It is immoral to ignore what science tells us that will inform the way that we teach reading. This is a game changer. 
The science of reading refers to 50 years worth of research from around the world about the brain, how proficient reading and writing develop, why some kids have difficulty, and how to assess, teach, and improve outcomes. Dr. Melissa Weber Mayer, the literacy chief at the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, explains that the science-based teaching includes five key skills. They are phonemic awareness, which is the sounds that we hear, it is phonics, which is connecting sounds and letters, so identifying letters, but also knowing all of the sounds that those letters make, because letters make more than one sound. It is the amount of vocabulary that we know or, and are exposed to. It is fluency, and fluency not just in reading paragraphs, but also fluency in how fast can I decode a word and how accurately can I decode the word. And then comprehension, which is do I bring meaning to what I'm reading? So part of what's happening in your brain is as you're being taught in this explicit, systematic, sequential way, your brain is, is putting this into your working memory so you can apply this later when you come to words that you don't know. Dr. Weber Mayer believes the move to science of reading instruction, which only some Ohio schools have made, is urgent. 40% of Ohio's third graders are not proficient readers. It is urgent, which is why, in places like Cincinnati, Dayton, and Heath, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and First Lady Fran DeWine are watching the science of reading instruction in action, while pushing for every Ohio student, K through 12, to receive this science-based, systematic approach. We know that reading um, proficiency dictates quality of life. We can make a huge difference in the lives of, of Ohio students. We saw nearly a double of percentage in annual growth for their iReady assessments. It is absolutely worth the investment, and I would argue that it is the highest lever for improving student outcomes as it relates to early literacy. Bar, sing, swing, what rhymes? For usually separating words and making them and spelling them and just fun stuff like that. How do you feel, old friend? I love reading. I read almost every night. It gives me enough confidence to like break down any word that I don't feel confident in. And be thinking, what does the word say now? And I'm proud that I have that much confidence because my teacher taught me how to gain it. The C makes the sound. It is so fun to see the light bulbs going off when students are listening, speaking, writing, using tactile um, activities. All parts of the brain um, are being activated. When uh, my students uh, first took the district diagnostic assessment, we had 61% of my third graders below or well below grade level. Now we have 63% of students um, at or above grade level. It was not about poverty, it was not about students' home life, it was about what we can do, what is in, in our control in this building, what practices can we put in place to make sure that our kids are literate and that they can read. Do you tell me the whole word. Are you ready? Tap along with me. Our students in grades three through five engage in vocabulary instruction every single day. Build background knowledge, learning the definitions, using it in sentences, talking with partners. It feels good to have our parents walk in during our literacy nights and say, hey, thank you for doing this. I can use this with my family at home or with my kids. K through second grade. Our students engage in phonemic awareness activities every single day. Activities typically include rhyming, segmenting, blending, onset and rhyme. This activity helps them to understand how words are put together and taken apart. When I think about literacy, I think of the great equalizer. It's equity. It gives them access. T U C K. Third grade proficiency test scores jumped from 50% to 91% over a four year period at Riverside Elementary. Today what you're going to do is practice doing tap it, map it, graph it, zap it. Literacy specialist Margot Ship works with teachers and even the new principal. Spell it for us. S-T-O-P. Zap it. Stop. Nice. To support science of reading instruction. This district is willing to pay to have their teachers continue, the new teachers come in, so that everyone speaks the same language. Three, 
from intervention specialist to the speech language pathologist to the kindergarten teacher to the sixth grade teacher, everyone can talk the same thing. At the beginning of the year, I was reading six words per minute. And today? I can read 101 words in a minute. Early reading achievement has a multiplier effect, creating more and more opportunities, which is why teachers are passionate about the science of reading methods they are seeing transform students every single day. I want them to have the same chances that their other peers may have. I want to be a pharmacological scientist. I want to be a pediatrician. I want to be a realtor. I want to be a scientist. When they come to school, they should get what they need in order to be successful in this world. They deserve that as children. Good things are coming. It's a start to empowering every child to meet their potential and do what they can do. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for letting us be a part of this conversation uh, locally, how we're looking at the science of reading. You're no doubt going to hear some recurring themes and some recurring pieces of information, but I think it all bears repeating so that we all can collectively go out and inform others about the importance of the science of reading, how we can all embrace it and create more proficient readers in our community. So we want to just build a little bit on the research that you, the highlights you saw in that video and talk about how it's been transforming Warrensville Heights City School District. And so Kelly, I'm going to ask you first, um, why are we hearing so much right now about the science of reading? And how would you respond to those that think this is just a fad or another program that we have to do in the schools? Uh, the science of reading is not a fad. It is not a pendulum swing. It is the evidence that will unlock the keys to the kingdom. It is the moral imperative that must propel us forward in our profession to make sure that all students can read. The science of reading is the evidence um, to combat the poor literacy rates across the country. And the third time we're gonna hear this fact because this is our motivator, is that 40% of Ohio's children are not proficient. That is our flame lighter. Educators and parents recognize this need and they're looking towards the evidence to solve the problem. What specifically started this conversation or blasted it into the stratosphere because it is not new is some of the reporting done by educational uh, journalist Emily Hansford. She's written many educational articles and she has a podcast, Sold a Story, that created quite a buzz. In Sold a Story, she identified an overall disconnect between the evidence and classroom practice. So this body of evidence is ever changing and growing as we learn more, and the science of reading isn't a single program or a series of programs, it's a body of research that informs the instructional approach in the classroom. So Donald, I'm gonna turn it over to you what led Warrensville Heights down the science of reading path as early adopters? Well, I think we became earlier adopters because of a sense of urgency. Uh, when I arrived to the district, the district was one of the lowest rated districts in the state of Ohio. In addition, there was a House Bill 70, which was the state takeover bill. Uh, I didn't even know about House Bill 70 when I took the job, so <laughs> it was an immediate urgent um, matter for us in our district. I do have one of our teachers here, she now works with Be uh, Bedford, Ms. Martin, who was part of our team there, where we really started off with looking at how we were teaching reading. Um, as we reviewed our reading structure, we were teaching whole language reading. We were just teaching kids to memorize words. Kids were not putting sentences together. We, a kid would get a word and just skip it. Uh, we saw low, very low comprehension. So we immediately went, and I listened to our teachers, I listened, I worked in Cleveland for 17 years, went to Wilson's Foundation. So that was the first move we made and dedicated time every day for our kids to get phonetic instruction. We started working closely with the ESC. Uh, we did a, a curriculum audit where we looked at our curriculum, we looked at our resources, we looked at our time on fast, we looked at who was teaching what, we looked at our professional development, and with that, um, our curriculum audit, we. Uh, 
started to get the um, Strive and Readers Grant with the ESC. Uh, once we got that Strive and Readers Grant, we were able to dedicate time K to 12, look at our resources, um, really reallocate our schools. We redid our schools where we uh, dedicated a 2 3 school. We um, wanted to get ba uh, um, band sizes closer so that our teachers could collaborate, work together so they could plan reading. Um, we created an assessment system where we had to know where kids were. Uh, one of the key things in our district is we have to know what kids need to know. Then we need to know how, if, if they don't know it, and then we gotta know what we're gonna do about it. So we then started an uh, intervention system so that we are now monitoring our students, and this started immediately, monitoring our students, knowing where they're deficient, and then providing immediate support. But it took a great team effort to recognize some great people. Roxanne Lothar, who was our curriculum director, Dr. Tamir Caver also, um, who spearheaded a lot of the work, and we had some great principals. But again, the urgency, is we can't produce students graduating into the world who cannot think critically, who cannot go into the world and be successful. And that starts with those third grade reading scores. And you know, they build jails based upon third grade reading scores. So that was an urgent issue for us in our district. It was a combination of almost being took over by the state, but also being urgent to the work and want, not wanting to be a failure, not wanting to produce failing people, wanting to produce people in our community to be great. And I also can say our community was very supportive of this because it took very hard decisions because everybody's not committed to it. We also had to train our teachers. Some of the teachers, I was a trained teacher, pre-K teacher trained, um, pre-K to three, and I was taught whole language. How to, to, I was taught how to read through phonetics, but I was taught how to teach through whole language. So we have to reprogram our staff to think different. And then one of the key factors is raising expectations. A lot of times kids don't read because people have low expectations and people count kids out before they even get there. A kindergartner who doesn't know his letters is not the kindergartner's fault. You can't blame the kindergartner. So we have to own the work and make our people own the work um, throughout the process. You gotta have people who don't look at our kids as deficits or look at what they don't know as a deficit, but look at it as an opportunity uh, to provide them with the resources they need. Donald, thanks. It's really helpful to understand what the change looks like in practice. Kelly, can you expand on what we saw in the video and what, we, what we've heard from others about what the science of reading shows about how brains learn to read? Right. So in recent years, our knowledge of how the brain acquires skills in reading has evolved. But the facts are still startling, right? And again, I'm going to talk about lighting that fire. In the United States, 14% of the adult population is below basic and unable to perform functional reading tasks, as highlighted by the National Adult Literacy Survey. 29% are at basic, and, but below intermediate, and 13% are classified as proficient. The two lowest groups do not read with fluency, accuracy, and comprehension necessary to decipher newspapers, tax forms, health guidelines, schedules, or manuals. So although adults are constantly exposed to print in the environment, they may not learn to read. And this is a myth and something that Donald and I were both taught in our prep programs, print rich environment, still important, but not the main ticket for instruction. The brain is not hardwired to read. And this is surprising to some educators and parents, especially if reading came easy to you. The brain is hardwired to speak. So students must explicitly be taught codes of many languages. They must internalize the relationships between the sounds of a language and the systematic representation of those sounds. So it is something that is exciting because we know what to do. There's no more mystery. And all students who are taught this can learn to read so that we can fulfill our all means all. So, Donald, back to you. With all the research, I've heard you say it's back to the foundational basics. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, so again, as I spoke earlier about the whole language, now we are going back to teaching kids how to sound words out. What is a base word? What is a prefix? What is a suffix? They're learning fluency. They're learning speed. They're learning all these different things where before, again, like I saw in my observations and from our data, they were just skipping passages. If it was too hard, they wouldn't even try. So we're getting back to the foundation. I, I believe many of us in here in the same age group, we were taught how to read, basically the science of reading. 
it's back to where it was, the way it should be, and we will see our kids be successful if we all commit to it. Again, it goes back to teacher training. Again, our teachers were trained in letters training. We mandated letters training in 2020, so this was before the state mandated because we saw that we did have people in our district who were resistant because they just didn't know. And when you and it's impossible for a principal to monitor 20 classes a day to ensure that the teachers are teaching the correct way. So you have to have people believe in it. You have to train them in it. And then my key word, and I always tell everyone this, you have to inspect what you expect. If you expect it to be done, you have to inspect to make sure it's being done on a daily basis. Collectively, if those things are done, you should see improvement. And then the ultimate measure is engage students, students in school. We talked about um, students not coming to school. Well, if you like school, if school is enjoyable, you have positive experiences. And I believe reading and those type of experiences make school enjoyable, you're going to come to school. Those statistics that they stated are when kids don't, are not engaged in school. School is hard. They can't read. They can't um, participate. So this all goes hand in hand. As we engage students, we train our teachers, we prepare our students for success. Those uh, attendance rates going to go up. Graduation rates will go up. It all goes hand in hand. And I believe that it has to be a will for that because, again, it's real easy for a troubled child not to come to school for people to let them stay out uh, because they don't disrupt. But we have to disrupt their discomfort by giving them what they need so that school is an enjoyable place so that they can come and compete in the world that you have to be able to think critically in. Kelly, can you share some more specifics about House Bill 33 and how the requirements of it support the shifts in practice to implement the science of reading? So my department at the ESC spends a lot of time supporting school districts on the implementation of House Bill 33 because there's a lot of moving parts. So the first moving part is that teachers are, and administrators are required to complete science of reading coursework. And this is the first step in our language calibration, our knowledge calibration of what needs to be done in our classroom. So it's step one. The next step is that schools are required to purchase high quality core curricular materials as well as evidence-based reading intervention programs as designated by the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. So there's an approved list of vendors that school districts are to pick from. But this is a very extensive process. It is not just pull up the list and pick. You have to meet as a team, as a school district, and decide what do you have that's working really well and where are your deficits in order to make a very informed decision to be a critical consumer. Teachers are also administering dyslexia screening measures that screen out these tendencies for dyslexia, and teachers are creating reading improvement monitoring plans for students in K-4. to so our teachers and administrators are very busy deploying this new evidence. So Donald, back to you. Warrensville Heights just adopted a new reading curriculum. Can you tell us more about that journey? Yeah, it was a very intensive process. Again, um, Roxanne Lozar led that, but we kind of knew that there was going to be a selection process for the new curriculum. So in 2022, um, they started looking at different curriculums. It's very difficult to have a team pick a curriculum because everyone on the different teams had different ideas of what was the best curriculum. But ultimately, we looked for the curriculum that had both. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is acceleration. You have to have a curriculum that has acceleration. We have kids that are above grade level that school gets boring for too. So what we looked for was a curriculum that had acceleration, but also intervention. And ultimately, we settled on CKLA, which our staff believes had both the acceleration and had the, um, the, the finesse awareness items that we needed from the small, they had great exposure in it, they had great interaction. And regardless of different people on the team had different ideas, it's one team, one vision, one goal, everyone now is on board. So one of the purposes of today is to talk about how the schools and community can align to um, move this effort forward. So Kelly, why is it important to have a shared understanding of the research behind the science of reading and specifically in schools? How can administrators and teachers work together to move this forward? 
Well, I think Donald just segued perfectly with what did you say, one team, one vision, one goal? And that's the ticket. Uh, we are experiencing a teacher shortage, all right? We have to make things manageable, doable, and we have to support our educators. So this requires, to create the system of excellence, a coherent central office that is engaging with our stakeholders and identifying the priorities, which means that we might have to de-implement or clear some things off the plate. Teams of people have to work together. Just like Donald said, picking a reading curriculum is not an easy task, even with an improved list. We have to create the vision for the work and we have to check in on the progress. Where do the barriers exist and what needs removed? Um, we need a work plan written. My office, we always say, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. We need to write it, we need to communicate it, we need to revise it, right? And we need to celebrate our progress. But to have this system of excellence, we all have to be towing in the same direction and not everything can be a priority. We want to make this doable for our teachers and we want to be able to support them by a clear, focused vision. So, Donald, can you talk to us about the importance of leadership in this work? Yeah, so I think leadership is essential. One of the things, and I've worked in urban schools, is the inconsistent leadership. When you always are changing leaders, then what's expected is, what's expected is not expected. And every year, there's a new change, new turnover. I just, my, I implore the leaders and people in charge that you always, we need consistent leadership in order for anything to change. When you continue to change the leader, then the kids get left behind. They always do. Um, if you check any scores of data, when there's a consistent change at the top or a consistent change at the principal position, then the kids get left behind. It's very important that we have consistent leadership. We have visionary leadership. We have people who are committed and make literacy a priority. It, you know, sports are important. All these other things are important. But if you are not in those classrooms ensuring that this literacy instruction is going on, ensuring our kids are learning on a daily basis, then it's all for naught. So I just, my, 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 I'm very passionate about this, is that we have to let people do the work. And if we allow them to do the work, give them the tools to do the work, so people need resources to do the work. They, they need to be able to be creative to do the work. We do something called no new instruction where every peer, one hour a day at our elementary school, we go over, it's an intervention block or an acceleration block. So if you are accelerated, you get accelerated. If you need intervention, you get intervention. We can't sit in these rigid blocks of where it used to be or where it used to go, but have to be creative and allow our leaders to be creative and understand and respecting unions and contracts and things like that. But working in collaboration with our unions to get the bottom line, which is our kids are learning on a daily basis so that we can produce great citizens so they can be the next mayor, next superintendent, next council people. Because if you can't, if we're not producing them, we're just producing a world that is scary. So it's a collective effort for our teachers, staff, and community to hold our leaders accountable but give them the time to do the work. Donald, thank you so much for your leadership and the hard work you guys are doing in transforming Warren, Phil, and Kelly. Thank you for your expertise and all the research. I think we still have some time to open it up for some questions from the audience. Hopefully they're not too hard. So uh, thank you, panelists. And now for the audience, we are going to have two microphones. If you have a question, please wait until you get the microphone before you uh, ask the question. And we'll do a, just a few, between five and seven minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, everyone agrees. I love it. I think we have a question over here. Hello. Um, I'm Joan Spurl. I'm with the Literacy Cooperative Director of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library former kindergarten and preschool teacher. And I was hoping, Kelly, you might talk a little. Dr. Jolly stated that this is going back to basics. It's the same as maybe the way I learned. I'm 61. Um, I know this is not the same. It's um, better than the way I learned to read and write. It's better than the phonics instruction that I received. It's very child 
centered um, and engaging. Can you talk a little more about how it's different and, and even better than the way I learned? Well, I think that it is. Um, so one of the things, and I'm pulling back to our childhood here, is that there was a big focus on phonics, right? I had the red phonics book. I did it every day. And so this instruction includes more than just phonics. And we have more brain research um, to help support this. So we have theoretical models. We have math formulas that show us. Scarborough's rope shows us how all of the pieces weave together. So it's not just about phonics, because many times I'll hear teachers say, well, we're just going to add phonics. That is one piece of the puzzle. But we want to make sure that we have strong comprehension skills. So we have to weave all of our skills together, and we have to know the changing emphasis over time. What grade levels focus on what skills and when? What is developmentally appropriate and what do we do um, when we are not getting the results that we desire? Now, Joan, you mentioned the engagement part. That is critical. We have to have our students engaged. And through our evidence-based practices, this is not sit and get. This is sit and interact as you are learning to become a reader. Uh, next question, do we have, I know we have someone over here, any on this side? We have two on that side. Thank you, Kellen. Good morning and thank you for sharing. Uh, we're very proud of what we've done around tier one, a lot of similar things uh, to your team that you're describing. One of our challenge areas is really articulating what that looks like across tier one, two, and three in particular uh, in collaboration with our intervention specialists. Can you talk a little bit about how you are weaving different tiered of instruction uh, throughout this change? Really appreciate it. Well, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, again, we go back to our, our assessment system, which we are assessing our students on, on a pretty much on a weekly basis. We've hired intervention teachers, not special ed intervention teachers, but we have intervention teachers too per grade level. With that, um, they do pull small groups for our tier two intervention. Uh, we also monitor our lesson plans because sometimes it's not um, the students, it's sometimes it's the lesson. So that goes back to tier one and helping our teachers review how their, uh, their lessons and their process of, of how they implemented that instruction. Our tier three, our extreme tier three, uh, again, we use our special, our special needs teachers and our intervention teachers. So we have a, a thorough, a, a, a constant process of looking at our tier one instruction, ensuring that our tier one instruction was thorough. We have a, a, a strategic tier two pullout um, model, and then our extreme model, that's for the extreme cases. So I hope I explained it, um, but I, I can show you better. You know, one thing I want to add, that's why I think it's really important to have a literacy team within each building so that you're constantly calibrating your tiers of instruction and deciding where do the tiers fit. Because tier two doesn't have to be a, a place or a destination. It can happen within the classroom. But it's understanding um, where students are at, what, the tier, what interventions we have to offer, and where it takes place. Because we really want to stop thinking about intervention as a place you go. Because as a teacher, it was like kids got pulled out. And then as a principal, I started asking, well, how many teachers have their kids in their class all day? And almost no one was able to say, I have my kids all day when we were self-contained. So I was thinking about for kids, is that disjointed instruction? So having that team that's constantly keeping their pulse on the data and what students are doing and how the tiers are being deployed and the progress being made is really important. And it sounds easy as I sit on this panel, but we know that our buildings are full of teams. So how do we streamline and keep the focus on the priorities? I think we have time for one more in the, in the back there. Or two more, one and then two, and then we'll be done. Uh, good morning, my name is Sade. I am a local author and can attest to Superintendent Jolly, his uh, direction with the Warrensville City Schools. I had the pleasure of going into the kindergarten and preschool last year and it continued to go on this year. So I see firsthand of what he's doing and the impact that he has changed. 
Um, I have a question though. I am a mom. My daughter just got her first day of first grade today. Yay! And, Yay. <laughs> um, so she's considered one of those um, quote unquote COVID babies. Um, they were the ones that did not see the visual cues behind the mask for a couple years. So like with a lot of occupational therapists, speech therapists, they say that with this age, there's a lack of not of speaking and then that pack reading as well. So I, my question is, is there any um, research or data has been found yet that what we're I implementing with the sciences reading has long effects on those kids entering kindergarten and first grade now? Great question. You know what, I'm not sure that we know the answer to your question. Yeah. I'm not sure that we know that research yet. But we do know, I mean, you have your finger on the pulse here, that COVID has <coughs> caused delays in our students, not just academically, but social emotional. I mean, we're, we're reading the anxiety generation, right, with cell phones and social media, which took off during COVID. So I'm not sure that we can cite that evidence for you today, but it's definitely something that we need to keep our eye on mm -hmm. as students are coming to our schools, because again, we're focusing on, on all so no matter how we're coming, it is our responsibility, our moral imperative to get the job done. Thank you. Uh, we have one more there, and then last one will be Deb. So good morning. My name is Dr. Kenneth Hale. I'm with Cuyahoga Community College. I want to thank you all for your leadership, your commitment, and modeling the way. Can you speak to uh, the issue about engaging parents, or what can parents and strategies to engage parents to better prepare students at home for the reinforcement? So I think the Dolly Parton Library, we work with the Literacy Cooperative, is important. The, the Warrensville Public Library, very essential, because our parents go to the library. We have something called the One, Two, Three Reads program at the library, in which that's before they start kindergarten, they are part of that. I, I believe we have a lot of young parents at our school, and a lot of them have some of the same issues our students have, of not being exposed to certain things. And one of our charges is to do literacy nights and to give them the strategies that they need to help their child. So we do a literacy night every month to ensure that our parents are, whatever our teachers are doing, our, our, our parents get those resources. Because again, we are trying to help the whole family, and more we get our parents engaged, the more our students engage. So that's our, that's our strategy. We're small, we only have 2,000 students. So it's real easy for us to do a lot of things that bigger places can't because we can touch everybody. And there'll be more on parent engagement a little later in the summit as well. Deb? I, um, thank you. I've been uh, sitting here trying to think of a way Dr. Jolly has asked me this question without letting you know how old my daughter is that would impact how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to figure out, but I, I haven't come up with anything. Um, I'm sure it's packed in what you've talked about today. Thank you very much, very, very informative panel. But what I miss is how children are involved in the teaching or in the learning to read, how are they driving the engine? For example, I can remember when my daughter in kindergarten was learning to read, she was taught the rules. And what I mean by that perhaps is I before E, except after C. Um, all, all those rules. When do the kids get, you can't play the game without knowing the rules. And, or at least you struggle, you can't play it as well as someone who's being taught the rules. I don't see that in classrooms. I don't hear about it. Um, I'm sure it's packed in what you're talking about, but I didn't hear, it went over my head. Can you speak to that just a teeny bit? Who's going to take it? We're like fighting over here, like you take it, you take it. <laughs> so I, I have to say that that is part of the evidence is, is the rules. I mean, when we start looking at syllabication, morphology, students are explicitly learning the rules. You'll hear kindergartners know things that, I mean, I was never taught 
speaking back to Joan's question on the basics of the phonics book. So I, it's coming when it's deployed. The, the, pro, the issue is that we're rapidly trying to catch the field up. And it's coming, right? We have to chunk this for our teachers. But students will know the rules, that, as that is part of the evidence, right? But they aren't going to know it if we don't explicitly teach it and give the opportunity. Thank and, you. You know, and you bring up one last thing, that there is a role in the classroom for everybody. Students have a role, and they need to know what it is. Teacher has a role. They need to know what it is. Administrator has a role. Like, we all have a role in this system, and we need to be explicit about what it is because so that we can streamline our forces and move towards the target. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> and as they're exiting the stage, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all our City Year people here. This is our new cohort of City Year. Thank you for your help this year. I'm really glad to work with you. So now I'd like to introduce our second panel, which includes key community partners who have been leading who've been leading a wide array of liter literacy activities for many years. What's important to note is that I don't believe any of the next panelists are educators per training, but they educate the community all around in different, um, different ways. And they, I wanted to explicitly, as much as I, you know, I'm an educator, I wanted my educators to be first. I want to make sure our community leaders, who are so important to this side-by-side -side network, have a chance to talk to you all wherever you are in the spectrum, if you're an educator or if you're a community leader or a parent that wants to know how to be more, do more. So Felton Thomas is our executive director and CEO of Cleveland Public Library, if you would come up. We also have Bob Papanetti, who's the executive director of the Literacy Cooperative. Nancy Mendez, who's the president and CEO of Starting Point. And Kurt Caracal, the President and Executive Director Emeritus of the Third Federal Foundation. If you will please come to the stage. And then Felton, I think you're going to start with the video next. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to... Over the last 30 or 40 years, we have learned so much more about how babies and young children's brains work. One of the things that that's led into is a set of skills that promote literacy that we've distilled down to five practices. To read to them, talk to them, write with them, and that might be taking fingers and writing in the baby food. And we sing because that's a different part of our brain that gets engaged. And most importantly, we play. And so we help support families understanding that the things they do every day that seem really basic have a real big impact on their kids' readiness for school and for reading skills. So we come to Zero to Three Read With Me's because it's really interactive. We do lots of songs and lots of fun books. The best thing about coming here and doing the play dates every week with the story time and the activities and singing is learning that he's energetic and he can move around the room because it's age and developmentally appropriate. My son is uh, 23 months, he'll be two at the end of August, and we've been coming here for about, I'd say like eight or nine months. His language has like blown up since we started coming to Story Hour. Um, and Karen helps a lot with um, picking out books that help with specific types of language development. The other great thing about how this program works is that the adults who come are resources for each other. So moms and caregivers talk about taking care of their kids, just getting together. The big thing is socialization for him because he stays at home with us. So. Um, getting him out of the house and getting him uh, doing activities with kids that are his age and engaging with them. It's just other, hearing other kids speak because some of the kids were older and they were already, you know, putting a couple words together. So when my son came, he was probably only saying, you know, 15 words and now he's saying like, I don't know, 500 plus words. They do a lot of events. Like I know that there was just the tie-dye event and everybody made shirts and that was very, very fun. Uh, last week we came to a tie-dye day. We also went to the summer kickoff for the reading program at the night at the museum. That was really fun. 
libraries are all basically about literacy and supporting our communities. So here at Cleveland Public Library, we have been training our youth-oriented staff in the skills that are associated with the science of reading. Play is the work of children, and we give them good tools. So I just want to take the, the time to thank Chief Pomeran for seeing libraries as a very important partner in what we're trying to do with Side by Side. Um, I want to introduce a couple of folks because I think it's really, really important. Jacqueline Lamb, if you wouldn't mind standing, is our Director of Education for CPS. So for any of you in the organ in any organizations that are looking for somebody you want and you think library should be important and you want to hound somebody, go get her. <laughs> but a, a second and a really important piece that uh, we may not discuss today, but I think it's very, very important. And we have Tracy Strobel, who is the director of the uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library. <laughs> and I say that because one of the things that is really important as we do this work is recognizing that part of the struggle for many of our younger folks are because their parents don't read and their parents have literacy issues. And the Cleveland Public Library and the Cuyahoga County Public Library partner on a literacy program for adults called Aspire Greater Cleveland. So if you're looking for someone to hound around that, you can grab me or Tracy to discuss how we bring parents in and get them the literacy needs that they need to kind of move forward. So with that now, I can turn to our panel here because we have some very, very great folks who I'm very fortunate to create, get a chance to work with over the past 15 years since I've been here. And we have Nancy Mendez, who's the CEO of Starting Point. You can give her a round of applause. <laughs> you have the poster boy for Imagination <laughs> Library, Bob Papanetti, a literacy cooperative. And you have Kirk Caracol who proves that if the job is never done, he will be here forever. <laughs> so. well, we're going to start with you, Bob, right? Talk to us a little bit about what you have been doing. Obviously, we've talked about Imagination Libraries, but you, Literacy Cooperative, does so many other things. So speak to uh, your initiatives around the <laughs> Thank you, Felton, and uh, thank you for the great work that you and your team at Cleveland Public Library are doing to advance literacy for the citizens of all ages of our community. And uh, thank you, Chief Pomerantz, for asking me to be part of this exciting new narrative of literacy in our community. I love that video we just saw, right? I mean, that was a great video. You saw parents with very young children, under the age of three, working together, playing together, reading together, activating and firing up that brain. You know, the Literacy Cooperative has long believed that we have an incredible opportunity, in fact, a responsibility, to connect with parents of young children under the age of five to help those parents build the educational foundation of their children so that they can begin kindergarten ready to learn. In fact, the very first board of the Literacy Cooperative passed me with the, uh, the job of identifying an intervention that was helping children be better prepared for kindergarten. They knew that kindergarten readiness was an indicator of third grade reading proficiency, and third grade reading proficiency is a predictor of school success. And they saw the data then that far too many children in our community, upwards of 75% in some school districts in our community, are starting kindergarten behind. It was then and it is still true today. I learned about the SPARK program then that was created in Canton, Ohio. SPARK, supporting partnerships to assure ready kids, helps prepare children for kindergarten through monthly home visits that include the parent and the child. We brought SPARK to Cuyahoga County in 2011 as a pilot and worked with Family Connections to deliver the program. Through evaluations, we found that children who were involved in SPARK were better prepared for kindergarten. We turned Spark over to Invest in Children in 2015, where it continues to, to thrive and help children today. During that time, though, 
I was beginning to learn more about the science of brain development that we've heard a little bit about earlier today and in the video. Some of what I learned include the following. In the first 1,000 days of a child's life, 85% of the brain's total volume is built. What happens during the first three years of a child's life has lifelong consequences, for better or for worse. Those years represent an opportunity that will not come again. And when it comes to brain circuitry and wiring, it's better to get it right the first time than to try to fix it later. In 2016, I met Dr. Dana Suskin, who wrote the book, 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. It was one of the sources where I learned some of the information I just shared with you. Dr. Suskin wrote a second book called Parent Nation, where she believed that we need to do much more as a society to support parents during those early years in their child's life. In it, she writes, we are not born to be doctors, teachers, drivers, or engineers. To pursue any of those professions, we go to school to study and learn. We are not born to be parents either, but there is no school to teach us parenting skills. We are left alone for the most part to figure out what to do in this hugely important endeavor. And when you think about it, a parent is not only their child's first teacher, they are their child's brain architect. As many of you know, and it's been said earlier, the Literacy Cooperative leads the Dolly Parton Imagination Library program here in Cuyahoga County. And the program is specifically and only for children from birth to the age of five. Enrolled children receive a brand new age appropriate book in the mail every month at no cost to the family. And we have about 40,000 families who are enrolled in Cuyahoga County today. About 12,000 12, of those live in the city of Cleveland. And we know receiving this book in the mail every month has a profound impact on children and their families. So by virtue of a family signing up for Imagination Library in Cuyahoga County, we have the contact information for all of those children and their families. We have been leveraging this relationship to share information on important resources and services that are available in our community. And I'm certain we have sent some of the information out on, for some of you on, in, this community, in this audience today. We plan to expand that communication with families to include tips and techniques and in-person training sessions to help parents build the educational foundation of their child so that they can begin kindergarten ready to learn, to take advantage of the great teaching we have in our schools and the science of reading. So I ask all of you to join me, to join us, in creating a parent nation where all parents are supported during their child's educational career, but especially during those first three years of their child's life when it is the most optimal time for brain development so they can begin school ready to learn. Thank you. Thank you. It's really important. I think maybe we can get some questions afterwards to talk about parents because I think it's very really important. And um, the one parent who spoke to what is happening what, after the pandemic, how that's affected it. Nancy, it's kind of a segue into what Starting Point has been, been doing. If you can give us a little bit of, of the uh, comment on what Starting Point does and what are you doing and have done since the pandemic to really kind of help our parents and our children move forward. Well, first, thank you for inviting me here. I'm one of those uh, community organizations that work hand in hand with the state, the county, the city, and our school system um, to ensure that our children are prepared to learn and are successful in life. Um, so first, let me tell you a little bit about Starting Point, and then um, I'll talk about how, what are we doing post-pandemic, because we all know the um, effects that it had on our children. Um, so what is Starting Point? Starting Point at its core um, has begun, ha begun as part of the Step Up to Quality movement where we understood um, the importance of that early learning um, and as Bob just noted, is in particular the zero to three um, ages and how important it is that we see that as an opportunity to help build that child um, for success in education for the rest of their life and that we must take advantage of it. So there was a movement to build quality, uh, a system of childcare quality, both in centers and, and, and uh, homes. And we are one of the organizations that provides training, technical assistance to the teachers in those classrooms. And we do say classrooms. They, uh, we are teaching, it's an educational environment 
Um, and as a matter of fact, um, they are the first few components of the science of reading are taught to our teachers and are part of the curriculum. And in particular, uh, the, the phonemic awareness um, and also vocab vocabulary building is a huge part of early childhood education. So that's number one. We build quality in classrooms uh, through technical assistance and training. Then we connect parents to that quality. Uh, we have a resource referral uh, um, department, um, bilingual, and we also have an online service so that our parents, when they're ready and they need that childcare, call us or get, come out to our uh, website and we'll help you connect to quality childcare in your community. And we also educate our parents on the importance of childcare, again, to the science and, um, and awareness um, how important those first five years are so that that first day of kindergarten, they're ready to succeed. And quality childcare will help you get there. Um, we also just want to point out some of our uh, partnerships and who we work with. With the state, um, again, they are the primary funders of, of uh, Step Up to Quality. Um, and we have a part, uh, an incredible partnership with our Department of Children and Youth. Um, we also work with our county, and we're one of the few counties in Cuyahoga that makes a huge investment in children, in particular universal pre-K. And we administer that program with our county and are very proud to do so. Uh, our county also um, funds out-of-school time work, and we are the administrators of technical assistance and training to out-of-school time programs. And then lastly, I just wanna mention the investment from the city. We're one of the few cities that invested ARPA dollars into ensuring that during this post-COVID uh, crisis that we're having in childcare, that there was an additional investment in scholarship dollars and bonus and retention dollars of um, upwards of five million to keep our childcare system as stable as possible. I want to give you one example of another program that we do at Starting Point, because I, I just wanted to lay down the foundation of what we do, but there's a bunch of other programs. But there's one that I think that you might be interested in hearing about. And it's called LENA, and um, I don't know, I'm horrible with acronyms, um, but it's Language Environment Analysis. And what it does, it's really interesting, it's a, um, an evidence-based program where they put a uh, device on the child. It's like a little vest, it's the cutest thing. Anybody wanna come to starting point, I'll show it to you. And we measure the number of times a teacher speaks to that child. And then we sit down with the teacher after a, a certain amount of time and we go through that data and it's eye-opening for them. Many of these teachers, let me tell you, they are passionate, they love their children, but we all have unconscious biases and, um, and things that we, we, we don't know that that's in us. So some of the things that we find out is, you know, you really are speaking a lot to little Annie, but you're ignoring Bobby. And Bobby needs to hear you speak and interact with him. So his vocabulary increases. So he learns how to uh, pronounce words. And the teachers, I had no idea that I wasn't um, uh, uh, paying as much attention to Bobby as I was Annie. Um, it's been a huge tool to help our teachers understand how to better connect to every child in their classroom. It really has become an equity tool, if anything. So that's just one example of additional evidence-based programs um, that we are bringing to bear to our zero to five. Um, the last thing I'll do before I, I, I hand it over to Mr. Kirk um, is give you one more example of why we exist. We were approached by a grandmother who uh, was very emotional. Her daughter had just passed away and left her three children, two of them under the age of five. The mother had been very sick during COVID and those were COVID children as we've been referring them to. What really struck her is she received custody of her three grandchildren. Um, the five-year-old started kindergarten and was so behind. Um, she was 
she was incredibly uh, emotional, devastated that she didn't know how she had, what she could do for her five-year-old, and he was in an assortment of classes now to help him catch up. But she also noticed that the two and three-year-old were in the same place and wanted to act now because before she was part of the babysitting group that worked with her grandchildren. And she said, I don't want these two to have to go to that first day of classroom and experience what their big brother is experiencing. So she came to us and we worked hard to find her scholarships and, and a quality childcare um, that fit for her budget. And she came back to us about a year later and said, they're helping my five-year-old. They're um, being uh, taught so many things in this incredible environment through their, the, the songs they're singing to him are helping him. The play that they're been, um, teaching to help them pronounce words, they're helping their, their big brother. This has been incredible. I feel confident they're in good hands and they have now a good future ahead of them. This is the importance of quality childcare. This is how we connect to our friends over at K through 12. Um, and I know that we can just continue to build this partnership so it's seamless that every child, no matter their ethnicity, their race, their zip code, will be prepared for that first day in kindergarten. Thank you, Nancy. Really, really good. And Lena work is really, really important. I've seen Lena work with parents um, having their children at home with the vest on it and measuring how many words that the parents are saying to their kids. Really, really important. Kurt, one of the first people I met 15 years ago when I came here, uh, has been doing this work for a very long time and retired and said, I'm still very, very involved, right? Uh, you know, former uh, head of the Third Federal Foundation. Talk a little bit about what you've seen over the period of time and where we are now. And, this is an exciting day, what we see here. All of these folks here really tied into, like, let's all work together side by side. This, this has been a great event. Um, and um, the next year is going to be crucial as to whether we can all come together to support this, this method. You know, so I ran the Third Federal Foundation for 14 years from 2007 to my retirement in 2020. Prior to that, I practiced law. Uh, for 27 years. And when I was a young lawyer, I was a guardian ad litem at juvenile court. I volunteered to represent kids who were assigned to court. And it was such a sad experience because I saw kids who had so much talent, so much potential, but they were locked into a system that they were going to be in for their entire life. They are in a system because they didn't have the literacy skills to bring out the talent that they had. And you know what we spend in that system, that juvenile court system? A person that goes into the, the juvenile detention facility, our taxpayers spend $200,000 a year for that one student, that one person. And we spend millions and millions of dollars incarcerating people. If we took that money and put it into developing the skills of young people, our society would be so much better. Um, <laughs> I, I, talked to, I talked to Mayor Bibb when he was running, and I said, um, Mayor, if we concentrate on literacy, if Cuyahoga County or uh, Greater Cleveland was the most literate county in this country, we would have business knocking at our doors to come here to relocate. We need to prioritize on putting our priorities right. Um, and so when I, when I uh, took over my position in the Third Federal Foundation, and Third Federal is a bank that's located in Slavic Village, and so we made an effort to make an investment in those four uh, Cleveland Metropolitan Schools in our uh, neighborhood. Um, we spent about uh, a million, a little over a million dollars a year for a 12 to 13 year period investing in partnerships and programs with people who would enhance the educational opportunities for our kids. Um, people like the Literacy Cooperative, people like so many uh, organizations that could help build uh, the skills for parents and for kids. It was a program that invested in 
free birth all the way to children going to college, um, creating programs that, that really help build uh, the skills of people and of parents to try to build. As Bob said, it's so important to work with parents in that early stages. And, it, and I just want to say that, um, you know, that, that, that period of time where we invested over a 14-year period, I just want to give you some statistics about what happened. We were able to increase the number of free quality pre-K seats in Slavic Village by 10 times, from 30 to over 300 seats. So by 2019, 88% of our three and four year olds were in high quality pre-K programs. Uh, we were able to provide Spark, the program Bob talked about, for people in our neighborhood to go out and meet with parents, to talk to parents, about how crucial it was to understand the learning for their kids. And we started a SPARK program for kindergartners who came to school unprepared so that these social workers would go out and meet with parents of kindergartners so that they could catch up. We um, created, um, we worked in, with the literacy cooperative to enroll um, uh, kids in the Slavic Village Tali Pardon Program. All the kids in Slavic Village, we gave them funding to allow all the kids in Slavic Village to be enrolled in that program. Um, and that program provides a book every day for a child from zero to five years old. So that when a child starts kindergarten, they have a library of 60 books. And the amazing thing, and, and, and Bob did a lot of uh, evaluation of this program, it, it got parents to read to their kids. And it, it, it did an amazing job with that. We um, increased the number of, and, and basically we increased the number of children prepared for kindergarten by 185% by all those programs that, 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 that worked with them. Um, we uh, worked with WKYC to- <laughs> There's Margaret Bernstein for you to create a Slavic Village Reads program um, uh, with work with parents and children about the crucial role that reading plays in a child's life. We were able to introduce um, well over a dozen little free libraries in the neighborhood, and Channel 3 helped us celebrate those by having uh, uh, shows uh, on, the, on the news to celebrate when we opened those. Um, we, we were able to, um, with all those investments, and we invested in a lot of after-school programs, soccer programs, art programs, all kinds of programs so that the kids had things to do after school. We invested with the Boys and Girls Club, and Ron Soder at the Boys and Girls Club created some amazing literacy programs to help these kids. And as a result of that, um, we pulled all of our schools out of getting Fs on the state report card. All four of those schools. <laughs> Several of our schools got C's on the state report card. <clears throat> we were able um, to, uh, in addition, um, create a health clinic at Mound School, and we serviced not only the, the, the kids at Mound School, but we had a mobile clinic that went to all our schools so that we were trying to serve the health needs of our kids. We created, we provided wraparound services for those schools. So there was somebody at that school that talked to children about their needs about their housing needs, about their food needs, about their health needs, uh, and, and those investments made a huge difference in what happened in those schools. Um, we actually, by the end of the, the, this time, increased the number of students passing the state third grade reading guarantee from under 50% to 95%. So that, that investment made a huge difference to these families and to these kids. And in the state of Ohio, we need to invest in children. Um, we still, the Supreme Court of Ohio has held the way we fund education in Ohio unconstitutional three times. And our legislature refuses to change the way we fund. We rely on real estate taxes. And real estate taxes means for wealthy communities, they have fantastic systems. But poor communities, poor rural and urban communities, 
don't have the money to deal with the poverty that they have to deal with. It should be exactly the opposite. We should be having the, the, the poor rural and urban districts having the money to deal with the poverty and those issues that they have to deal with. Because the parents in those wealthy school districts, they'll make that provision for their kids. They'll find ways to get their kids what they need. We do it just the opposite way. And our legislature needs to change the way we fund education. <laughs> so basically, I, I think the science of reading is a great thing to, to, to mobilize around. But what we need to do, we need to get those programs. We need to be able to have that money to invest in these programs, that the literacy cooperative, that, that pre-K does. All those programs are actually absolutely crucial to getting these kids to be able to lear learn to read by third grade. And that reading, re learning to read by third grade is actually crucial to their success. Um, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kurt. So you've heard a lot, but we are, we have a little bit of time for questions. I, yeah, I think we have a time for two questions, but we'll have another opportunity towards the end. So we have two questions, one over here. Hi, thank you. Uh, so first off, just as the son of a 30 year librarian with the CCPL, I really much appreciate everything the libraries do. I work for an organization that works with adults who are struggling with literacy. I've worked with actually some of the people on the stage. Um, but I just really want to talk or ask you to talk a little bit more about what can be done or what needs to be done. Because so much of what's already being done, especially like the Aspire programs, there's a lot of emphasis on workforce and college and career readiness. But one of the biggest predictors of a child's success in school is the reading level of the mother. And so we have a lot of parents and we have a lot of families who are not at the college and career readiness level yet, but still need that support. So can you guys talk about what can and what needs to be done to help those folks? I'm gonna start on that one if you don't mind. And, and thank you to our friends at Seeds of Literacy for all the work you do. Uh, so I, I'd like to kind of talk a, a little bit about, uh, we talked a little bit about state funding. We had a huge, we talked a little bit about COVID, this big pandemic and, and some of the resources drying up in terms of getting through that once in a lifetime pandemic. And so when I hear about funding, it's something that a 32 year veteran in education understands is always important. But I think even more important in my opinion is the integration of messaging and the idea of not adding another program and not adding another task force and not adding another executive director of something who's going to be really good at it, but instead taking it on, I think as Kelly had said earlier, in terms of making sure this was all of our focus. So in terms of helping adult leaders, Seeds of Literacy is, is so important and so impactful, but I also think it's sometimes this is, uh, I spent a lot of time working in county government, city government, and education, is that we, we give the task to somebody else. And that task has to be all of ours. And it has to be something that we think about through intention. And as we're teaching reading or doing our literacy nights, or having our opportunities with, with the community, or with our early childhood, or with the, the vest and talking about that, is that we take on that role within the own, only the community and networks that we currently have. Um, in terms of um, opportunities, I know uh, Dr. Morgan will speak to this um, in a few minutes, but using that network of people who, my mother-in-law always said it, you want something done, you ask a busy person. I'm a busy person, you are all busy people, but you took the time to be here because you know you gotta go back and I got a laundry list of things to do, especially because we're having a back to school fair tomorrow. But I want to make sure that I take this opportunity to say, this is not going to be at the bottom of my list. It's going to be the one, two, or three things. And how are we investing literacy and community investment in learning to read through the science of reading in every single thing we already do as busy people in the community? So I, I don't ever want to underestimate the need for funding. I just sometimes prickle at the idea that we want more funding when I think, and I've had to, for a first grade teacher in Cleveland for 22 years, do what I can with what I have and make it happen that day. So, to quote my 
uh, four days of watching the DNC and staying up much too late, we have to do something. Thank you. Just very quickly, if I could just uh, add to that. Um, first, let me just say, if there's more funding for Starting Point, we're available, uh, <laughs> of course. There's plenty to do. But the reality is uh, that um, funding is a process, it's limited, and um, there's a lot of advocacy around it. And I want to get back to the power of alignment, of collaboration, coordination. We have great partners. I have great partners in this work. Um, there's Invest in Children from the county that I work with, uh, Pre for CLE, that it works super uh, focused in, in the city of Cleveland. Um, on and on and on, many partners. And what we've learned is the power of coordination that we don't duplicate, we leverage each other, um, knowing what the reality is about the environment and um, the economy and potential funding. So what can we do now? So I would encourage continuing to meet, plan, coordinate with the services that we have now um, and also align with our school systems so that it's a warm handoff and those children are ready to go day one. Thank you. Thank you just to, just go ahead. To, just go to, ahead. Uh, Chris's question. I think, you know, we, everybody in this room has a relationship with families or a person based on the work you may be doing with them, whether it's teaching them adult literacy skills. How do we leverage those relationships to connect families to other services and resources that there are in the community? You know, the Literacy Cooperative has been leading a coalition of service providers to build a whole family approach to this, to really begin looking at a family as a single service unit as opposed to a series of several service units that are all siloed. So as Nancy said and we've been talking about, there's an opportunity to collaborate, to actually share contact information that you have with some of your families and, and um, customers to connect them to other services that other members of their families may need. Okay, uh, any final words for this panel, uh, Felton? Well, no, I was just going to say, if there's one thing that can come out of this, this meeting here, if there is an organization you need to network with, take this opportunity. Because Seeds of Literacy, Aspire, we need to be partnering better around and leveraging each other for what we do um, around adult literacy. But all of us can talk when we are working with young people, when we learn their parents have struggles talk about and know a little bit more about all of the organizations that can do that work. This is an unbelievable opportunity that it, we have today and that we have over the next however long you decide to do this, right? Yes, I, I didn't say that because I didn't want to tell you that that's what you have to do, right? This is, <laughs> this is an all-in approach that we have to, to look at as all-in. And I just think that we have to commit, like you said, this is, we're busy people, but we have to decide that this is the all-in moment. Thank you, Felton, and thank you to our panelists. So, so now we're going to um, reposition. We've got a, a video that we're going to show, and I think I'm going to ask Felton to stay on. But I really would like to give one more round of applause to Kurt and Bob and Nancy, and thank them for their youth, their passion, and their talent in so many things. And I think we're going to cue the next video, and this video is something that has come to us um, came to us, I think we got it like yesterday. Um, and the video that we're going to show next is comes um, under the direction of our Cleveland Teachers Union President, Sherry Obrinsky. Uh, many of you know I was part of the Teachers Union um, for many years to, while I was teaching in the classroom. And when I first started in this role, I was so thrilled to be part of the Cleveland Reads program that it started a little bit before me, but I was glad to kind of jump in. And as the Cleveland Reads program continued to go on, um, I remember Shanice, my colleague, Shanice jo Dr. Shanice Johnson, Sherry Obrinsky, and I were looking at each other, and, I'm, and I think we had just finished with the big parade in December, and I'm like, all right, what are we doing now? And they're like, I don't know, we gotta get through this. We had this huge celebration. So through the work and leadership of both Cleveland Public Library, Sherry Obrinsky, who cannot be here because she's still at the DNC, um, and I asked, well, can you send a representative from the Cleveland Teachers Union? And she said, well, you know, Michelle, it's the first week of school. They're teaching in their classrooms. You should have had this after school. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you for the gentle but firm reminder. So our teachers are in the classroom. But what they did today was send this video instead. And I think you'll see um, 
some of the things that have been done and some of the things that are going to happen in the very new future. And I'll let you show it from here. And then we'll have uh, Felton, who's featured prominently Over in the Santa hat. Over the last the Cleveland See community next. came together around literacy. We wanted to improve literacy in our community with our city partners, our partners at the Cleveland Public Library and at our school district along with a number of other community partners. And so we came together to form Cleveland Reads. We're going to read one million books and 10 million minutes. When kids read, a city rises. Yep. We are showing the nation that Cleveland supports our children and Cleveland's going to fight for literacy every single day. We gave away about 60,000 books to our community. Our community read over a million books and millions of minutes. It was a resounding success that culminated with a December parade for reading. One of the first times I've ever seen, first of all, a parade in Cleveland, but also a parade for reading. And we knew as we were going into the end of that year that we needed to go further. That's why the Cleveland Teachers Union is launching side by side. And side by side, we're going to work with parents, we're going to bring in our community partners, and we're going to use the best in the science of reading to help improve literacy in our community. We believe that the union is the perfect organization to bring this program to life and to scale. Our members are experts in this content. We teach and work all over the city, and we're not going to wait. We are going to hit the ground running and get this program launched this fall. Most of my Early literacy is critical to the success of our students and our schools. When students read well, they do well at school. And in order to make that happen, we need parent involvement because parent involvement means that our kids are excited, they're on task, and they're eager to learn. So that's why Side by Side is so important because parents are the missing component. Getting our parents the information they need to, in order to help their students become better readers and to be more successful. Starting on September 14th, educators will host hands-on parent training events at libraries across the city to meet with families in a whole new and different way and to create this excitement about reading, the science of reading. Well, it's so important for the schools and the yeah. libraries to be working hand in hand because we're the after school place of learning for our kids. Libraries are the perfect place to host this program. First of all, we have access to our children's librarians who bring reading to life for all of our kids in our community. We also have parents exploring the library, sometimes for the first time ever, and it gives them the opportunity to see what a wonderful resource their branch libraries are, and at a time and space that's more convenient to them. This program would not be possible without the partnership of AFT. We approached the AFT earlier this spring about creating a training program for parents, something that we didn't have the time or the expertise to do, and the AFT responded in a big way, creating a program for us quickly and then training our teachers throughout the course of this summer. We also will be partnering with the AFT to continue to provide books for our families throughout the course of the year, building those home libraries. Books in their home for kids to just come, pick out whatever interests them, whatever looks good to them, just grab something that makes them want to read. Our teachers are the front door to ensuring that our children have the skills they need and the confidence they need in school. And as our teachers are stepping up every single day, fighting a good fight, it's so great to have them as a champion in this important work. I really love how organic our approach has been to this. When we first started partnering with the Cleveland Public Library around the idea of Cleveland Reads, it was a splashy, big, community-wide event. But when we started talking about how we get down to the nitty gritty, how do we really help families improve literacy? How do we give parents the tools that they need to help their children? It was clear that it needed to be a grassroots, bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. Our members talking one-on-one -on -one with families, talking one-on-one -on -one with parents and caregivers, and the children's librarians and our branches working with the kids to help them bring out their joy and to help them see the excitement that they can find at the library, nothing is better than what we're going to see this fall. And I just can't wait for us to continue the progress that we started two years ago and to see how much farther we can go.
So, um, so now we're going to get into that part of the nitty gritty. Um, and um, I think the event, post this event, again, I said at the beginning, it's not a one and done, but the next one that we know that we're going to get geared up for is going to be the September 14th. I believe it's at two branches. Yes, our Rice and our Lorraine branch. Great. Oh, east and west. I, um, your Lorraine branch is where it has the big walrus in front of it, and that's where I uh, got my books out. And I've, I've returned, I think, almost all of them by now. Um, but I'm glad Don't when you read. Don't say almost. <laughs> almost means we have to come get you. I, oh, you know where to find me. Um, so again, it's in that, that west um, branch is where um, I think the teachers union members are going to train some of your librarians. Is that what's going to happen next with that? Yeah, well, the next step is actually, it's that combination with the teachers and the librarians bringing in young uh, parents with their children. And the librarians are going to work with the children while the parents, uh, the teachers are going to take the parents aside right. and then start working with them to understand how they can work with their children better. And I think that's an opportunity, and we'll be talking with the teachers union about identifying parents who might not feel comfortable in, in being able to read to their kids and seeing how we can help them. And I think it's important that it's that they parents understand that it's not something new or some you know when they hear the words the science of reading and they want to continue to reinforce it's what sounds can you practice at home what phonemic awareness and sight word things and you saw what was that what were they doing in that video zip it lip it and chip it or something like that what's it called Donald Something like that. <laughs> but I mean, whatever the cute little things are, you know, and even the rules that, that, that um, Deb had talked about earlier. So it's September 14th, two branches, my old branch with the walrus in front of it, and then uh, which one's the, in the Harvey Where's Rice the branch? So the Lorraine branch actually doesn't have the walrus. Is I that didn't Eastman? Wanna, that's Eastman branch. Okay. Well, I'll still come. So I just, <laughs> so I didn't want anybody to get confused. Okay. Sorry about that. It's not the walrus there, but it's the Lorraine branch and the Rice branch. 10 to 1 o'clock. The idea is to invite everyone in so that they can have those conversations with teachers about their children. Um, and then the librarians will pull them aside to do story time for the kids while the, teach the parents are able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with teachers. Great. Great. And thank you to all of your library people for the Cleveland Reads and this continuation of not only Cleveland Reads, but Cleveland Learns to Read. And Cleveland Learns How to Teach to Read. Thank you so much. Right. Any questions about the panel or this before I get to my next second to last guest? I think we have someone back there with the white sweater on. We'll just do one quick question and then we're going to get to uh, my favorite part of the program, my uh, Dr. Warren Morgan. Hi, I'm not sure if you can answer this for me, but I'm with the Community Foundation of Lorraine County as part of that, the coordinator of Lorraine County Imagination Library. And 60% of our families, all of the books that they get through us are majority of their libraries. And they love to read with those kids. But do you have any advice or how can we kind of engage or address the gap for families who aren't as interested in continuing some of this work at home? Well, I think I let my panelists sit down before I uh, uh, said that we could ask a question. Um, anybody on the panel? I mean. I know it sometimes can be hard to be motivating. I, I know I was a single mom for, for four or five years and it's kind of like you come home, you work, you come home, you get dinner on the table and it's time for a bath and a bed. Um, so I think from my opinion, it would be continuing to bring them opportunities to have family functions at school or as the library's doing, the librarians are gonna read story time so parents can have that intersectionality. I think one of the, one of the goals of this summit is to make it easier for parents so that as our our community networks, hospitals, grocery stores are intersecting with young children that we can see if we can find ways to have little uh, phonics tips here, there, and everywhere um, so that they can feel not only confident but do the little reading games. That's, that's, how, um, that's how I kind of help my kids with homework was in the car driving back and forth, but it is those continued reading tips. Um, I know in Cleveland we have something called Say Yes to Education. The executive director, Diane Downing, is here with us. And, and to Kurt's point earlier in terms of that wraparound service, we have family support specialists fully funded in every single one of our schools and our partner charter schools as well to help support that bridge between family and community. Um, so I guess the, my tip would be to make it, the, keep it simple, make it fun, have some food, and make life a little easier while you're int intrinsically directing these signs of reading tips. 
And Thank Michelle, you. can I just add to that? Um, we're happy that you're here from Lorraine. This is awesome. That's even a bigger network than I think we envisioned. Mm -hmm. But after this summit, what we will be doing, um, with the help of all of you after completing the exit survey, is really filtering, organizing, and highly synthesizing the resources that are out there so that we are all messaging the same information. One of the things that um, we learned with a lot of the work that Kurt was referencing was that we didn't have the science of reading structure or approach. And so there were just a lot of different messages being thrown at families. In fact, we did a, a health and education literacy project where we really confused some family um, caregivers because they were hearing multiple messages about the best way to do this work. And so Michelle has asked all of us to sort of offer up what we have, and then we'll be working with the experts from the ESC, from the state, and from other places to make sure that we have a very tight message that'll be available at a few reliable places so that we can update it frequently and make sure it's user friendly. And again, if anybody in the room has suggestions about how to do that post summit is where that action is going to take place. Thank you. And I don't know if all of you know, has anybody here have met Patty Choby before? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Patty for helping us with organizing everything and keeping uh, this going. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. So now it is with my great pleasure that I get to bring up our, um, our last, second to last uh, speaker and um, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. CEO Warren Morgan. Dr. Morgan has just finished up his first year as the CEO of Cleveland Schools. We've had a busy year, and this week, today, is the last day of the first week of school for most of our students. So without further ado, and I hope you'll give a big round of applause to somebody who has so much work to do and took so much time out of his time to make sure he's here today, I introduce Dr. Warren Morgan. Well, I know that it's been a long morning already, and you guys have heard so much uh, great things already from the panelists and uh, just from all of the, uh, the great wisdom that has been here. So uh, I, I don't want to spend too much uh, time, but I just want to extend uh, some gratitude uh, first uh, to Michelle Pomerantz for putting this together, uh, to Mayor Bibb for his vision, uh, making sure that this is taking place. Uh, I know in uh, Governor DeWine's absence, but also his vision really around the science of reading, and uh, Director Dakin, thank you for your visionary leadership and also your partnership. Looking forward to continuing uh, to work with you. Uh, I know I have uh, board members that are here. Our board chair is here in the back, Sara Ellicott. Thank you for being here. Uh, I believe earlier, I don't know if Dr. Sridhar is still here, and Maduri LeBron. So uh, thank you. Oh, Maduri, I see you out there. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for your, your, your leadership. Um, as uh, Chief Pomerantz mentioned, I'm wrapping up my, uh, well, I finished my first year, now heading into what I'm calling my sophomore year uh, as a leader of uh, C, uh, CMSD. And as you heard, the science of reading is nothing new. It is what Dr. Duke at uh, the University of Michigan says, it's good teaching. It's just how you teach uh, reading in a very effective way. And so it takes all of the practices that we've learned over time to really make sure we have best practices. And uh, in a moment, I'll talk about our new ELA curriculum that we're implementing this year. But even last year, we were using the science of reading in many different tools. You're seeing uh, uh, tools like Hegarty and Letters, all of these different tools. And thanks to the ESC for training our teachers uh, in the practices of the science of reading, and all of this is led by our visionary chief academic officer, Dr. Selena Florence, who is here with us today, uh, new to our district, so thank you so much for your leadership. But we saw a lot of gains last year. Let me talk to you about some of the incredible gains that Cleveland Metropolitan School District made over last year. So first, many people may not know that uh, attendance is up uh, from where it was before. We decreased chronic absenteeism by five percentage points. With all the challenges that happened nationwide with FAFSA, CMSD grew in our FAFSA completion rate last year than where we were the year before. <laughs> College applications are up by eight percentage points. <laughs> Math proficiency on the Ohio State test was up by three percentage points across every single demographic group. And then English language arts, which is why we're here today to talk about the science of reading, was also up 
by three percentage uh, points across every demographic group. There was only one demographic group that stayed the same from where it was previously before. So this works. And where there was a parent that asked the question about uh, pandemic learning and the pandemic gap. One, some of the work I did when I was a chief academic officer in Indianapolis public schools was to make sure we had a centralized curriculum grounded in the science of reading. And in just one year, we were a actually able to grow our English language proficiency pr uh, uh, from where it was pre-pandemic. So this method does work, even with COVID loss. And so we want to make sure we're grounding in this principle. I'm really excited that this year we have for the very first time a single curriculum that is grounded in the science of reading. It is high quality. It is high, uh, it's uh, uh, rated high on ed reports that we're implementing in every single school. A district as large as ours is near, nearly ha uh, has 40,000 students. We have high mobility rates. And I see City Year in the room. They help us with our attendance, so shout out to you. Uh, and they help us with, uh, you know, with the, the mobility rates that, that take place. But now with a single curriculum that is grounded in the science of reading that every student can have, that no matter when they bounce from school to school, it supports the work that we're doing. So we want to continue to double down on this initiative, and I'm just continuing to look forward towards the growth. Though we've made growth, and I'm very proud of the progress we've, we've had, and we've worked with many of our partners. I see Say Yes is in the room. College Now has been a partner that has helped us. We have a lot of work to do. You heard earlier, the proficiency rates are not where they need to be. And this is a call to action to us as the adults. It's work that we need to do. I heard earlier the moral imperative. So this is work that we have to collectively do. And so when I think about the partnerships that we're doing uh, with the Cleveland Teachers Union and uh, the Literacy Collaborative and uh, Cleveland Public Libraries, as well as uh, the Education Service Center, to make sure we're curating resources, not only to supplement the curriculum, but also giving parents resources so that when they're going into the library, they can actually pick books that are on that list. They can also read to students outside of the classroom time. All of this is only going to supplement the learning that is taking place, and this is necessary. It is only going to be the way that we grow in this proficiency. So we need to do this work together. We need to do it collaboratively, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, later on today, you'll get a survey about how you can actually help us curate and build out that list of resources that we'll be using with our families and with our parents. So we want to make sure that takes place. You know, while I'm up here, I also want to make sure I, I share a couple of other things that we're doing as a district that we would also love your appreciation and support. I'm very proud that we will have our first electronic grade book uh, this year that allows our parents now to have access, real-time access to how their students are doing. Uh, and so this will help parents also uh, know how their students are doing on the science of reading. We are also a cell phone free zone uh, school district this year. <laughs> Thanks first to the vision of Governor DeWine. We heard that in his state of the uh, state address uh, and took note of it. And I also want to uh, uh, thank my colleague, uh, uh, Superintendent Jolly, who uh, when we were rolling this out, I remember calling you uh, last winter and saying, hey, they, they rolled this out last year. I was like, what did you do? What did you learn? And he said, in Warrensville, when they rolled this out, uh, behavior decreased and also productivity increased. And so I thank you for your partnership. You helped us with that. And as our entire village, help us as we're trying to implement this for our scholars and our schools. But it's been going well so far in all of our schools. And then the, the last call out I'll do is that on September 21st, we're going to have our Step Up to Kids rally making sure that this is a collaborative effort in our city, not only to promote the science of reading, uh, but also to make sure that we're getting our babies into school. It's about getting kids into school, making sure that they know the importance of school. So our Step Up to uh, Kids rally will be on Saturday, September 21st, and you'll be hearing more information about that too. Uh, I thank you all for uh, your participation uh, today, for your continued support, for your continuing rallying. Our kids can, and will achieve at high levels. So also what I, I heard one of the pa panelists say, it's about our expectations. So we need to raise the bar high and we need to do the work together. So thank you for this work and we'll keep on. second favorite part of the program and actually um, I started uh, teaching in Cleveland schools at the old Harvey Rice 
Does anybody remember what the old Harvey Rice looks like? And uh, it was 1990. St. Luke's Hospital was still um, open. And I was a first year teacher, and I didn't even know where the east side was, let alone Shaker Square, which is not a square. And I, was a te I grew up on the west side by the library with the walrus. And I, I was so nervous. I went to Harvey Rice. I'd never been there before. Um, I went and I interviewed. They hired me. And they were like, OK, good luck, and here you are. And here's your whole class of first graders. And I had some really nice teachers that were next to me. And I had some curriculum, and I had some other things. But there was no, and I had some standards. Of course, I had a lot of standards. But there really wasn't a, um, and this is what I like so much about what's happening um, with the science of reading in Cleveland schools. There was not an, I had like everything thrown at me. Well, what are you going to use? And so do I use this? Do I use this? Do I use this? Well, this teacher's using this. This teacher's using this. And I wanted to be successful. Um, and so one of the one of the opportunities around professional development that at the time was to go to this place on Larchmere called the Cultural Exchange. Anybody hear about the Cultural Exchange? How about that? So I'm not that old. I have some friends with me. And actually, the Cultural Exchange has been going and going and going. But at the time, I figured out where uh, Shaker Square was. So then I started popping into this Cultural Exchange. And I met this lady, and she um, was telling me all about this program called Read Baby Read. Anybody remember that one? How about that one? Give us a round of applause for that. And I remember being you know, a, a girl from the west side, coming to the, seeing these cool things happening at the Literacy Cooperative, and then getting the opportunity to understand that what I needed to bring into my classroom was that opportunity to have books who looked like the children of the classrooms I was teaching and to have experiences and understanding and to create little book clubs even in my own classroom. So while I had the curriculum and instruction and I was working very hard with my one red phonics book that it was pink after a couple years because I used it so many times, but I got the chance to meet Debbie McCam. And so Debbie McCann was there, and she taught me a lot about how to teach reading. She taught me a lot about how to carry myself as a white teacher from the west side of Cleveland, first time coming over to the east side in the early 90s, and that it didn't matter is what book I was reading. It was how to do it with children and what to expect from children. So fast forward, I did a couple other jobs. And uh, last year, I think it was at your listening tour, um, one of your listening tours, uh, in the Glenville community and all of a sudden this lady with this big curly hair comes towards me and I'm like I know her so getting the opportunity to be a first grade teacher in 1990 and then becoming the chief of education and being able to see her again was really exciting to me because it was like oh my gosh somebody that was at my beginning is still here with me and we're still on this charge so we got together to talk a little bit about literacy and so it is with my great pleasure that I can bring my friend and somebody that has been a long timer in the literacy space, Debbie McCam, to close out our program. Well, I've learned a lot. How about you guys? Yeah? I didn't sleep all night. I didn't sleep all night because Michelle had pumped me as to who would be in the room today. And uh, those of you who know me well know that this is my thing. This is what I love. And I was hoping that everyone who was invited would come because then I knew that there would be children in the city of Cleveland and other, other places that would benefit. And that, after all, is what I'm about, children benefiting from the science of reading. Stand up for me. Stand up, please. Did that well. Uh, oh, have a seat. <laughs> I want you to know that we don't need one other person to enter this room 
to accomplish our goal, to change the quality of life for children. We don't need one more person. We got enough people right here. This is all it takes. This is what we need. You got the labels, you're smart, you're interested, you came today, so I know you're interested. This is all we need to change the life, the quality of life for children in our communities. That's why you got to keep this going. You got to make sure that you tell us what your interest is, how you want to be helpful. I'm usually, uh, you know, before some health challenges, I was in a classroom or two in so many school districts every day. And back in the day, 32 years ago, when I started, kids would be so excited to see me. Oh, the lady with the books, the lady with the books, here she comes, read, baby, read. Now they say, what you got for me? What do you have from pre-K through 12th grade? What you got? Because they now understand you've taught them that this reading thing is important. If they are to go further, they've got to handle this reading thing. Go to any classroom, those of you who are working in your offices or in your towers, and ask a child, what is the most significant thing for you? And they will tell you, I got to learn how to read. And a lot of kids identify themselves as non-readers, as non-readers. At the end of every summer, Read Baby Read is over, and I always say, OK, how many are going to read this summer? How many are readers? And I can still hear the boy, Kevin Lee, who said, not me. I ain't a reader. And so I was lucky enough, you know, to get someone on my board to uh, tutor Kevin Lee, and he passed third grade. And it's, it's one of the most significant things for me that has happened in my 32 years. So imagine what we could do. Imagine what we could do. I mean, I know some of you are here because your job, or it's, it's Friday. Maybe I can get out early, uh, whatever. But imagine if we collaborated. You know, I love books. Everybody knows that. I like to teach teachers how they smell a brand new book. I know it sounds weird, but a brand new book, how it smells. Oh, by the way, how does it sound when you open it? OK, I know that's weirder. <laughs> but it makes a sound. And if you are not teaching that, you are not starting at the beginning. Who wants a mechanic that doesn't know where the engine is? So Michelle, would you hand me my bag right here? I want to Bear with me just a minute. I won't be that much longer. Um, let me ask you a question. Michelle, you can't answer. I know I already uh, did this with you already. What is, and raise your hand if you know the answer. Don't shout it out. Don't look at your phone. Don't ask your neighbor. What page is it? Raise your hand. Your teacher, your educators, your principals, your superintendents. What is this page called? OK, I love your honest. It's an honest group. Oh, somebody, yes. 
No. But I like that you were brave. I like that. Not the cover page. What page is that? Page is that? It's not in all books, but it's in a lot of books. It's in most books. So here's my point. This is what I'm going to write on my list. I want to be helpful. Because if you are teaching the beginning of reading preschool, you got to know what that is. How are you going to start from the beginning and teach anything if you're not teaching it from the beginning? You know what I'm saying? Just nod your head if you get it. OK, OK, so I'm still on track. It has a name. It's in a lot of books. And your preschoolers, all the way up to 12th grade, should be taught how it sounds, how it smells, how it feels, a brand new book. So when they get that book from Imagination Library and it's coming, they're so excited. They're knocking people down. They can't wait. I thought about this since I've been here. We've been watching for the last month now blue to uh, the Olympics. And then thank goodness, because I was home from the hospital, had to, be, had, had to be in the bed. So thank goodness the, 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 uh, the conventions came. Now, as cool as it was last night, as exciting as it's been all week, regardless of who you're choosing to vote for, they didn't mention the number one thing that ails us in our country. Children can't read. Somebody wants to tell me that with all these people in this room, we cannot teach a kid to read millions and millions of dollars that we can't teach children to read. It's two things. You're not smart enough or you're not doing a good job. I know better than that. I know better than that. So if we get together and we have conversations like this, like real ones, like real conversations, if we have the intention of changing the lives and the quality for children and their families, and oh, by the way, making lifelong readers. I don't just want them to, you know, pass this grade. We want lifelong readers so that the quality of our space is so much better, that their lives are so much better, that they can give me the right change at McDonald's. Oh, that's right. I don't eat at McDonald's anymore. I forgot. <laughs> Not supposed to eat it. So that's what we're doing here today. For real, for real. That's what we're doing. We're putting, throwing away all the shiny stuff. You know, even though I think that at a cultural exchange we do some of the coolest things, a lot of we're best practice for the US Department of Education with Read Baby Read. We have the busy bookmobile that travels through neighborhoods, and children hop on, and they buy a book. Uh, we love people who give them away. But we're not a, we are not a government cheese program. When people, when kids, when preschoolers invest in their books, they take pride in it. They take pride in it. They don't throw them all over the place. So you buy a book for 50 cents, 75 cents a dollar, brand new book. It's yours. When I go into classrooms, what did you do with your book? My father built the bookshelf. I keep mine under the bed with a flashlight. So uh, we think we're on to something. 
a hundred men reading, African American male initiative of men reading to children in preschool. Um, Parent Teacher Resource Center. So that's how it's it's about the books. So you go ahead and teach them how to read, and then you send them to a cultural exchange so they can buy a book of their very own, an investment in themselves for their very own. I was at Riverside, little fat white boy, no waist. But a belt, but no way. <laughs> and uh, the book that they were reading, they were in uh, in book club at uh, 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 Read Baby Read. And so they were reading one of my favorite books, because I have 10 favorite books. This is one of them. Be Good to Eddie Lee. And it's my favorite book because in Read Baby Read, you learn that Floyd Cooper is an African-American artist, but there are no African-American people in this book. Um, you learn that uh, even though the third graders are talking about this ailment, Eddie Lee gets the girl at the end. <laughs> so I love this book so much. So imagine the teacher reading this book and then at the end of the at the end of four weeks you get to take that home. Now who else reads that book? Other kids in your family? Uh, mom's now involved, dad's not involved, she's peeling potatoes, but she's listening to the reading impacting families. So some of that work that you're doing. I need you to look very closely because you think one child is being impacted when the whole family, the cousins, the neighbors. So I want you to talk about your work. When we get together again, dig deep. Let's talk about the work. Let's see how I can help you, how you can help me. Let's see, Mr. Curricle, he's got all that money. Let's see how he can help us. So um, I started to tell you that the little boy told me when I asked him why he was in and what did he know about a cultural exchange, he said, I don't know anything about you all. I don't care who you are, but my older brother and my younger brother can't read, and reading is my responsibility in my family. So that's why when the teacher announced it, that's why I signed up. We got just enough people in the room to make that happen. However, hopefully we'll decide that the grocery store guy, maybe the pastor in the church, maybe somebody else that we know that's very interested in kids being better off, I, I started talking about the election. Not one time did they mention reading. And that's, you know, I think, I just happen to think that's what ails it. You can't be healthy, you can't be wealthy, you can't have a quality of life for yourself if you cannot read. If you cannot read. Please, think about it. So next time I come to this gathering, I'm not going to talk so much about how fabulous I am or how wonderful or how long I've been doing this. I'm going to go to the nitty gritty and talk about how, what my issues are, why I can't accomplish what it is we're trying to accomplish. And I'm going to be honest with you. And you're going to be honest with me. Because that's the only way we're going to get this done. Mayor Bibb and Governor DeWine. I've been doing this, like I said, 32 years. And I never had a chance 
to work with two leaders that believed in literacy at the same time. So we have to put that on our list and thank them and congratulate them for finally looking at literacy. Other mayors have not done that until they're on their way out, interested in literacy, interested, but they got a whole bunch of other bit not knowing because we haven't gotten to them that workforce development is impacted by literacy. And that, after all, is what they care about, workforce development. So we gotta get the word out, we gotta impress. You guys are fabulous. Um, the other things I wanted to talk about have already been said. We don't need to repeat, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tell them, uh, what's that page called? What's that page called? Oh, anybody? No, you probably have looked in your phone. So All right, well, I guess that's what... It's just called the end page. The end page. The okay. end page. It's All right, let's hear one for, more for Debbie, and thank you for getting us to lunch. My best friend. Good lady. Okay, we're all Oh, one more thing. Okay, they're, they're hungry. Uh, Dr. Corley, can you just stand? For me, Dr. Just Myrna please. Corley. Okay, see her? We spend every night on the phone, boring, just talking about kids and how we're going to get them reading. Okay. Thanks, thank Dr. Corley. Thank you, Dr. Corley. Okay, last thing I'll say, thank you again, Debbie. Um, as, as Debbie mentioned, we're going to kind of check in again. Who wants to? I, I really appreciate all of the panelists. I appreciate everybody at Cleveland State for helping us set this up. And I'm going to end this by saying, as we're gathered here today to learn about the science of reading, how classroom learning will change for all our children to learn to read at grade level. Second, we are not here to establish a steering committee or create a new organization to oversee this work. We are here as a network of leaders who can strengthen our network of literacy resources to bring individuals and families together to help them succeed. And finally, we're here to recognize that our teachers cannot do this alone. They need help reinforcing classroom learning at home and in the community, which is why we're creating the side-by-side -side network. We're here to join forces with our friends and colleagues, superintendents, academic chiefs to help support, and now with an access to a model for community-based coaching and curriculum developed by the American Federation of Teacher Staff with leadership from our local teachers union and public library. Tomorrow, I have another event. We continue our work with literacy at Mayor Bibb's Back to School Fest at Public Auditorium. The event starts at 9 a.m. Free packs of school supplies, a huge book giveaway, and parent resources and activities will be helping there tomorrow, 9 a.m. to noon. Free parking at Willard Garage. Please encourage your families to attend. And the last thing I want to do is to thank everybody once again for coming and spending the morning learning about the science of reading. Thank you. The QR code is up for you to access the exit survey, and it's also on the Eventbrite site as a link. And there